Good evening, everyone. Okay, so welcome to this Monday special webinar series on TPO. So this series happens every Monday and we focus on CENTA International Teaching Olympiad, which is popularly known as TPO. And today is the 13th webinar of this series and it is on decoding CENTA International TPO Early Childhood Education Track. We have Miss Monica Rishi here as a facilitator for the uh, early childhood education track today. Ms. Monica Rishi has over 10 years of experience in the education sector. She has completed a double B.Ed, a regular and in special education. And uh, she is also L1 certified SEEL facilitator. She has spent majority of her teaching career in early childhood education and now she has found her true calling in teaching special education, special needs children. She currently works as a special educator with the primary wing at Shivnada School, Faridabad. She also has facilitated various literacy and numeracy workshops for early years in her current school. So uh, in, her to, uh, in 2016, Center TPO as well, Miss Monica secured 14th rank in Haryana and was among the top uh, 500 nationally and in 2021 as well uh, she secured rank 4 in CENTA TPO for early childhood education track and again like I mentioned she is also a CENTA certified L1 primary teacher so we are so happy to have you here ma'am welcome on board thank you Ruchika I'm very glad to be here and part of uh, being uh, the center TPO decoding webinar for early childhood, especially, I'm very excited to meet all the educators who join us today and uh, welcome you all along with Ruchika for today's evening session. Thank you so much, ma'am. So here uh, we can see that a lot of people have joined from various parts of the country, various parts of India, various parts of the world. I also have one request like people who have joined, if you can drop in where you're joining from, your current location, maybe if you're comfortable, your school that you're working with and uh, your location so that we also know that where we have our participants for today from. So we, uh, like I can see that we have uh, Devjani ma'am from Nasik. We have uh, Prachi ma'am from Ranchi. So we do have people from various parts of the world, I would say. I could see somebody joining from Egypt as well. Uh, some time ago, I saw a comment. And so we are really excited to have all of you on board. And with that note, yeah, so just I'm just going through the comments and just getting very excited. People joining from uh, Mam School itself, like Shivnadar, and people joining from Bangalore. So welcome on board. And on that note, uh, we will start with our webinar series. Just uh, give me a moment so that I can share with all of you what we need to discuss. All right. So like I said, welcome to the webinar for uh, early childhood education track, which is the session 13 for this one. For uh, like, as many of you might know that the first edition of the center TPO was in 2015. And we are really proud to be hosting the eighth edition of center international TPO this year. And again, it's eight, uh, eighth year of centers existence. The CENTA TPO was started because CENTA is fundamentally about creating reward, recognition and career growth opportunities for the teachers. However, when you look at the career growth, it happens over a longer period of time. So we wanted to introduce something that will lead to immediate reward and recognition for uh, competent teachers and the purpose of CENTA TPO was to have an annual competition where teachers can compete at a large scale forum and showcase their competencies and get rewarded immediately for the same. We have been fortunate for over these many years that we have uh, distinguished partners like Reliance Foundation, Education World, and the, we also have other support groups 
to provide rewards and recognitions for the winning teachers. Moving forward in today's webinar, we will be covering certain points which include the overview of what CENTA International TPO is, then details of what prelims is, the format of it, different mark schemes, the competencies covered in the prelims test, and main highlight is the unpacking of CENTA TPO Early Childhood Education Track using uh, sample questions so that we can give you a gist of what kind of questions are there in our uh, tests. And finally, we'll also share with you some resources which you can go on to to prepare for CENTA TPO 2023 over here. So again, uh, here, since 2015, firstly, giving you an overview that uh, we had only nine, uh, like right from the beginning, we had 20,000 candidates that have participated in teaching professionals or Olympiad for Center flagship initiative. And the diversity of participants has been phenomenal. We are really proud to say that this year we are fully online and fully international. In 2015, going back to the first TPO, we had only nine subject tracks. And now cutting to this year, we have 39 subject tracks, which we are covering in the TPO test. So here, uh, these 39 subject tracks really include tracks like addition of uh, EVS track, Hindi language tracks, co-curricular, and there are various others. Uh, going to, again, taking a glimpse from 2015, we only had multiple choice questions in the TPO test. and But later we soon realized that in a teaching Olympiad test, we need to test uh, the skills beyond just MCQs. And that is why we also introduced a video component to our test, to our TPO, which is the uh, which will going uh, which will be going to explain the further uh, section of the presentation. Uh, then just the brief so far is that this TPO is fully online this year, where, which means you can attend it from anywhere, wherever you are at your home or your workplace. It happens in two, stage, uh, two stages. Firstly, this prelims and the score of your prelims decide uh, the top, the toppers in the prelims get the invite to the finals, which is finally the Teaching Professionals Olympiad. And like I said, this year we are going fully international. And the prelims format consists of a combination of 50 MCQ tests and two short videos. And it's a two-hour test slot for the prelims. After that, like I said, we have a format for the prelim test. So this format... Uh, the TPO prelim format has a total of uh, 50 uh, MCQ questions divided into two parts. First, as multiple choice questions and the second as verbal communication test. Talking about the first component, the multiple choice questions have four different sections divided across, uh, divided in this particular component where the first section is about subject expertise where you will have 20 questions and they will make up to 30 marks for this particular section. Then we have subject pedagogical content knowledge section with where you will have eight questions around the pedagogical content uh, about your track, which will comprise a total of 10 marks. And the third section we have is uh, of 12 questions, which is common pedagogy, as in pedagogy, which is not specific to any grade level or any uh, subject, but it is common across uh, the teachers at the school level, and it consists of 20 marks in total. And the fourth section is about professional competencies, where we have 10 questions and there are to, uh, it comprises of total of 15 marks. So this is the first component. It has 50 questions and it, uh, the four sections uh, make up 75 marks of the test. The second component of our TPO prelim test is verbal communication test, which consists of two questions, where the first question, or since it's a, it's in the video format, so we say that the first video will be about the subject-specific verbal evaluation, 
where it will, uh, you will be evaluated on a rubric of 15 marks and the second video is about subject agnostic verbal evaluation again it will be around uh, it will not be specific to your subject or your grade level and it consists of 10 marks making the second component of 25 marks so the mcq and the verbal communication test part in total they make up 200 marks 75 and 25 so uh, moving on we have the test framework so the framework that look uh, this is what uh, broadly the framework looks like which we just discussed the time for uh, this is the time for the first component which is multiple choice paper is 1.5 hours where all these four sections will be there and the image the lower image shows you the platform how it looks looks like so you will be given a login to a platform where you can see all the four sections on your left and uh, on the main screen you will see the question where you can mark the correct answer and uh, you can move on to the next question like that you will see the timer and everything so the lower screenshot is the idea to give you like what our platform for the test looks like moving on to the framework about the verbal communication which was our second component of our test uh, it uh, you will be required to take out half an hour as in 0.5 hours for this two video questions where duration will be five minutes for answering duration will be five minutes for each of the questions and it happens on the zoom platform where we ask you to be present on a zoom platform in the breakout rooms and you will be assigned separate evaluator for this particular test and they will be giving you questions and they will be recording your response and then evaluating them as well so uh, moving on uh, with the framework we do need to discuss that we do have like i mentioned we have a lot of partners so um, moving on to the partners for center international tpo uh, 2023 our partners so far have been uh, so so far as in from 2022 we have partners like uh, primary partners like uh, reliance foundation we have in association with uh, education world with additional partners like University of Buckingham, Tag Life, TIS, we have Inspirit, then University of California, Santa Cruz, Oxford University Press, we have Think Startup, Key Education Foundation, Teach for India, and Bharti Foundation as well. And there are various prizes and benefits uh, that we also provide for the winning teachers as well. So all the partners bring many interesting prizes and rewards where some of which are, as you can see, are listed on the screen as well. The Reliance Foundation Teacher Awards, for example, are given every year to the winners of Centa TPO. Cash awards are worth around 20 lakhs. Uh, then we want to inform that this reward is restricted to teachers who are participating from India itself. Then there are other rewards, but however, as you can see on screen, there are other rewards which are open to everyone irrespective of where you teach. Uh, so we do have uh, a premium training opportunities available from Oxford, Buckingham, UCSC and Centre itself. So Oxford has training programs affiliated with Oxford University. University of Buckingham has projects where winners will get the opportunity to be mentored on a short research product, uh, short research project by professors along with a certificate of teaching excellence. UCSC is offering curated trainings and enrollment into their summer program in California. Inspirit is providing access to one of a kind software suite uh, where 3D and VR toolkit for science toppers are available. So as you can see, there are a bunch of different professional development and growth opportunities we have been, we have included in our prizes. And uh, coming to education world, they will provide media recognition for winning teachers and schools with the maximum number of uh, with the maximum number of winners. We also have exclusive opportunities by this for toppers from B.Ed. colleges. 
then uh, also winners will receive digital badges, certificates, and a fully uh, confidential scorecard. So unless you have a unless you have registered on behalf of your institution or from their side, your scorecard is fully confidential and personal, which means it will be provided only to you. So up to uh, uh, so as a decision, if you want to share it with uh, anyone else, you definitely can go ahead and just share this information around. So coming to the crux, like in a nutshell, the Centa TPO is about the reward, recognition, and celebrating the teaching profession. We are very thankful that a large number of partners, be it corporate, government, legends like Brian Lara or Howard Professor Fernando Rems, have also supported this initiative over the uh, over so many years. Also, for teachers like many of you who have been participating year after year, we are really grateful for the support and we are really grateful to be able to bring this opportunity to the teaching profession. Uh, today, like we introduced in the beginning, we have Miss Monica, who will now be uh, taking you across uh, different sample questions. And like we shared in the beginning as well, she is a two-time TPO topper as well. So it will be really great if uh, Monica Ma'am can start with sharing her experience in terms of uh, what it was like to take the TPO twice and have the recognition that she, she has got and what did she do for preparing and what was exactly the impact it had in your professional life. So definitely over to you, Monica, ma'am. Thanks, thanks a lot, Rachika. And I would like to wish everyone again who has just joined, uh, we warmly welcome you today's, uh, to today's webinar on decoding the Centa TPO. Uh, so yes, I would like to share about my journey with Centa, and I would like to begin with a quote that education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And Centa has done just that for me. It has inspired me to overcome my fear, face my challenges, and strive for more. It brought me to the realization that to be an effective facilitator, I must be open to continuous learning. I must be open to change and to being unique. So I would like to share a little bit about my journey. Uh, first time that I appeared for Centa was way back in 2015. I appeared in the primary tracks for English EVS and I secured a national position, which was much appreciated by my then organization. And this fueled me to again appear in Centa 2016. And this time I secured the 14th rank as Ruchika had shared in Haryana region. After this, we were invited to an illuminating workshop by Centra, where they shared with us the latest ICT technology tools in teaching and learning. It was a very enriching workshop. And I have been invited here today as in 2021, I appeared in the early childhood track and I secured the fourth position nationwide. Why I appeared for early childhood track is because most of my experience has been with the early childhood years. I wanted to check my knowledge, my skills, and whether I'm updated with the changing times. So to prepare, I again went back to the curriculum that we were following, to the pedagogy, to the lesson plans, and I revisited my techniques, my practices as an educator and a facilitator. One thing that I have learned about myself in this journey is that I like to be a continuous learner. I'm a lifelong learner, and I want to challenge myself and that is why I appeared in the TPO. The goal was never to secure a rank, but to keep on learning. And also to be uh, an example for my children. If I'm appearing for an exam and I'm testing my knowledge, of course I'm going to motivate them. So I would really recommend that all of you educators appear for Centa TPO. I have been associated with Centa for the past eight years. And it has really helped me in my career development and my personal development by motivating me at each step. Because when you challenge yourself, you realize that there's a lot to learn. And while you learn, you grow. So I truly recommend all of you who have joined today to appear for Centra. And like Ruchika said, it's a journey. So not for one year, 
but uh, continuously to see yourself. And maybe you can try different tracks if you teach, uh, you know, early years and you teach primary years as well. It is a very good idea. Myself, I've appeared for primary English. I've appeared for primary all subjects and early childhood as well. And I currently, I'm a special educator. So again, I'd like to welcome all of you. And with this, I'd like to move on to sharing with you the sample uh, TPO questions. And when we look at the sample TPO questions, we have a fair idea as to how you reply, what you think when you reply. And I request all of you to please log into menti.com. You can see on the screen, uh, kindly log into www.menti.com. We would like to give all of you some time to log in. And once you log in, you can see there's a passcode shared on the screen. It's 15467. 409. You can enter the passcode as well. So I hope all of you will be able to log in from your devices so that you can participate. If anybody is facing any difficulty or you have any questions while logging in, you can ask in the chat. So you can see the first question on your screens and I would like to read it for you as well. The first question is, tongue twisters are often used as a fun activity in class. Here's an example. I saw Susie sitting in a shoe shine shop. Which of the following is not one of the primary purposes of using tongue twisters in the classroom. Option A says make learning fun. Option B improve sentence construction. Option C help students differentiate sounds. And option D teach new vocabulary to students. I hope most of you have logged into menti.com and are able to pass, participate along with all the educators. I would like to read the question once again for those who have missed. The first question that we have on the screen is, tongue twisters are often used as a fun activity in class. Here's an example. I saw Susie sitting in a shoe shine shop. Which of the following is not one of the primary purposes of using tongue twisters in the classroom? Option A, make learning fun. Option B, improve sentence construction. Option C, help students differentiate sounds. Option D, teach new vocabulary to students. Okay, so on the screen, we can see some of you are participating. We will wait for more of you to log in your answers. So I see a uh, lot of you are between option B and option C. So when, uh, when we'll uh, get more answers and we'll discuss the answers, I will share one important tip with you which worked for me as a participant over the year and which I realized was very important. very interesting to see 
so many answers a b 18 people think b is the answer 16 think c is the answer and some of you also think that d could be the answer That's very interesting. OK. So I think uh, most of you have answered. And you can see that option B is the correct answer. It's showing on screen. But why is it so? Let us discuss that. And uh, you can see uh, the first option. Yeah. So tongue twisters are often used as fun activity. And the question is, which of the following is not one of the primary purposes? So making learning fun, uh, it is, it, tongue twisters do add a fun element. So of course, uh, this option is not the one. Uh, then option B, which says improve sentence construction. Tongue twisters focus on pronunciation mostly. You know, if you recall that how we speak tongue twisters, so they focus on pr pronunciation. They do not fo uh, focus on sentence structure at all. So this is not the purpose of using tongue twisters in classroom. But let us look at the other options as well. Option C. Option C is also not uh, correct because tongue twisters do distinguish uh, between sounds made by some letters like we just saw. That, you know, I saw Susie sitting in a shoe shine shop. So there were sir sound, there were sure sounds. And option D is again incorrect because it is not the most effective way to teach vocabulary. Though they can learn few vocabulary words, but it is not the most effective way. So which is not one of the primary purposes, which is the most incorrect in this case is sentence construction. I can't teach sentence construction by using tongue twisters in class. So congratulations to all of you who chose option B. Yes, so we have 23 people, 23, uh, sorry, 24 educators who chose option B. So that is really wonderful. And those who did not can think about the reasons. And also maybe imagine in your class when you use tongue twisters, what will it not do? So as I shared one tip, is that when you read a question, like we read it twice here, at least read it twice. Uh, because there's a hidden thing in the question and sometimes we miss it. And we read it the way uh, we are thinking maybe at that time. And uh, that uh, makes us look at the question a little differently and not arrive at the correct answer. So you must read the question at least twice and then try and understand the options. So I think uh, we can move on to question number two. But before that, for all of you who have just joined, uh, you can log in to menti.com to start participating along with all of us. www.menti.com and then enter the passcode 1546740. And you can see the question number two is on the screen. I will read it for all, all of you here. Miss D'Souza is teaching her students counting up to 10. Which of the following arrangements of cups is best suited for this exercise? You can look at the pictures. There are four arrangements. Arrangement A, arrangement B, arrangement C, and arrangement D. Let me read the question once again. Miss D'Souza is teaching her students counting up to 10. Which of the following arrangements of cups is best suited for this exercise? And you can see the four pictures. And if you're logged into menti.com, you can start sharing your answers.
So as you think of the answers, you look at the pictures, maybe you can visualize your class and you can think of the reasons why you're choosing with the options. And I can see uh, some of you are use, yeah, some of you have chosen A. Nobody has chosen the option B. Some have chosen option C. Most of you are choosing option C and some of you are choosing option D. So add this is the early childhood track. Think of an early childhood classroom. So it's very interesting. And I request all of you should try an answer. That which one is the best suited? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so I see 31, 32 of you. Okay, and we can see already on the screen that the correct answer is option D. Now let us discuss why option D is the correct answer. So the ideal arrangement, you know, in order to teach counting up to 10 must satisfy two conditions. So the first condition is that the arrangement should be clearly having the first and the last object. Okay, just imagine early childhood classroom and you're teaching up to 10. So this is this is the first criteria that it should clearly have a first and last object. And the second criteria is it should consist of discrete objects with discernible differences. Discernible meaning visible differences between the 10 objects. Now let's look at all the arrangements. So the first one, it does not contain discrete objects with differences because all the glasses are stacked one in one another. So it is visibly also not clear. This is incorrect. Now let's look at the option B. Option B does not have a clear first and last object. Hence, this option is not also not very ideal for teaching, counting up to 10. Option C, where most of you have answered and chosen, could be a, an option, but all items do not have discrete differences. It is a close choice. It is a very close choice, but not completely efficient. While if we look at the option D, you know, in comparison to C, all the items are discrete with clear distinction of the first and the last object. So when the yeah, when you start counting, you start from the first object and you go on and you count to 10. All the objects are of different color. They are lined up in sequence. So they're counting from beginning to end in a sequence and they cannot uh, count it incorrectly because it is so clear. The objects are also discrete. And you can clearly see the first and the last object. And mostly when we count, we count from left to right. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And in early years when we teach, we're teaching one-to-one -one correspondence and we teach counting in sequence, in order. So the last a picture, the last arrangement of the cups is most suited when we're teaching counting up to 10 because the child is counting and touching one on one. Correspondence is also there. Uh, the number is in sequence and they can easily turn the order of 1 to 10. So very well tried. And now those of you who have just joined in, you can also participate with all of us. Please log into menti.com and use the code 15467409 to participate. And let us look at the question number three. 
Question number three is, which of the following questions does not assess students' pre-reading skills? Option A, show me the title of the story. Option B, show me the name of the boy in the story. Option C, move your finger and show me how you will read. Option D, tell me which of these pictures should come first, second and third. For those of you who are still logging in, let me read the question once again. Which of the following questions does not assess students' pre-reading skills? Option A, show me the title of the story. Option B, show me the name of the boy in the story. Option C, move your finger and show me how you will read. Option D, tell me which of these pictures should come first, second and third. You can start logging in your answers. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So we are talking about pre-reading skills. I can see most of you are choosing option D. Okay. Still many of you are answering. <clears throat> okay, so most of you are going with option D. Just show in case you're still not logged into menti.com, you can share your answers in the chat as well. So do think about the pre-reading skills that you teach and then think uh, which option does not access the pre-reading skills. Okay, wow, well, it's very interesting to see how differently everyone is thinking right now. And we can see the answer again on the screen that option B is the correct option. <coughs> Sorry, yeah, let's see why option B is correct. Now, uh, if we look at all the options, Option A is show me the title of the story. So showing the title is a part of building print awareness. And the student does not have to read, but only identify where it is written. <coughs> so when as a teacher, you teach the child to read, you hold a book and you always show the title. So you're not expecting them to read, but you're telling them that the title is here. Option B says, show me the name of the boy in the story. Why this is the correct option? This does not assess the pre-reading skills is because the student should be able to read to identify where the name of boy is written. But what are we assessing? <coughs> pre-reading skills. So for this, they need to know how to read. So this is the option which is correct. Option C, move your finger and show me how you will read. It involves building understanding of directionality. So whenever we're building pre-reading skills, we teach them that you have to read from left to right, top to bottom. And we do teach them that this is how the finger moves. So when a teacher does a storytelling class, uh, she shows the book and she moves her finger along with the text. She is not expecting the students to read along with her, <coughs> but only to realize that the text has meaning. Option D, tell me which of these pictures should come first, second and third. So sequencing pictures of story does not require students to read. It is a pre-reading skill. How? When, uh, you know, in early years, we read the books to children. They sh see the pictures. So they know this has happened in the beginning. This happened in the middle and this happened in the end. 
So through the pictures, they know that this picture is from the beginning, from the middle, from the end, without reading the text. And we use many books, which only have pictures also to develop the pre-reading skills. So option B is correct. As op for option B, they need to be reading at this time. So congratulations to all of you who chose option B. Okay. And we are on to question number four now. And it's very exciting to see all of you participating with so much enthusiasm and all of us thinking together also about all the options. Now I'll read the question number four. It says, which of the following questions can be used to check for understanding of point of reference while measuring lengths? Option A, ask students to measure a 20 centimeter long line using a 30 centimeter ruler. Option B, give students a broken ruler to measure dimensions of a notebook. Option C, give students a rope to measure the perimeter of a circle. Option D, ask students to measure a table using measuring tape in inches and centimeters. <clears throat> I will read the question once again for all of you. Question number four is which of the following questions can be used to check for understanding of point of reference while measuring lengths? Option A, ask students to measure a 20 centimeter long line using a 30 centimeter ruler. Give students a broken ruler to measure dimensions of a notebook. Give students a rope to measure the perimeter of a circle. Ask students to measure a table using measuring tape in inches and centimeters. So let's see the response. Wow, so many of you have already answered here. Okay, I can see most of you are choosing right now. You're choosing option D. Some of you are going with option C. <coughs> Excuse me. So like I shared, one of the tips which really worked for me is, uh, and sometimes when I revise, uh, you know, after attempting the questions, I see that I have read the questions incorrectly, incompletely, or not understood it the way uh, it is. Because sometimes we have a, a knowledge, uh, some thoughts in our mind, some already uh, ongoing lessons which we are taking. And uh, when reading uh, this, the question, you know, all those thoughts come to our mind. And we're not able to focus clearly also as an educator. So it is all right if we read the question twice and understand it more deeply. And sometimes maybe two options look quite similar. That could also be. So I can see some of you also choosing option A. And it is very heartening to see the participation by all the early years educators. Wow, so we can see the answer. Answer is option B. Now let's look at all the options once again. So which of the following questions can be used to check for understanding of point of reference while measuring lens? Option A was ask students to measure a 20 centimeter long line using a 30 centimeter ruler. This one, this option may or may not give an insight into students' understanding. So as a teacher, when I just want to check, <coughs> option A may not give me that insight. Okay, now let's look at the option B, which is the correct option. See, since the ruler is broken, the measurement will have to be calculated using an accurate point of reference. So here, the accurate point of reference is there and the students will be able to measure the length accordingly. Option C, you know, where we say give students a rope to measure perimeter of a circle. This allows uh, students to measure using different methods, but point of reference can't be checked. 
So that is the reason. This is not the answer. Option D. This checks for understanding of different measuring units. So the most correct option here is option B. Where we're giving the broken ruler to the student. And let's see. 17 of you have chosen option B. So very well done. And all of us are learning together and thinking together as well. So I believe all of you must uh, be logged into menti.com. If you're not, there's one more chance as we do have one more question with us. And do log into menti.com and participate. Now I will read the question number five. Active listening is an important skill that learners need to develop early on. Which of the following teachers is using the most effective active listening exercise that is both developmentally appropriate and pedagogically sound for kindergarten students? Option A, students are asked to make a story chain where every fourth student is supposed to change the direction of a story. Option B, Ms. Jasmine plays the alphabet song on loop in the background while students work in groups to make a picture story. Option C, Ms. Dia gives her students earphones to listen to stories when they are by themselves in their quiet corners. Option D, Ms. Simran tells a story. She retells the story and students need to clap when they notice changes in the original story. So while I read the question again to you, you can start thinking and answering as well. So the question is, active listening is an important skill that learners need to develop early on. Which of the following teachers is using the most effective active listening exercise that is both developmentally appropriate and pedagogically sound for her kindergarten students? Option A, students are asked to make a story chain where every fourth student is supposed to change the direction of the story. Option B, Miss Jasmine plays the alphabet song on loop in the background while students work in groups to make a picture story. Option C, Miss Dia gives her students earphones to listen to stories when they are by themselves in the quiet corners. Option D, Miss Simran tells a story. She retells the story and students need to clap when they notice changes in the original story. Let's see what you have answered. Wow, most of you have chosen option D. Nobody has chosen option C. Some of you are going with A and few are going with B as well. Uh, 29 of you, wow, 30. Great. So I can see more, more and more of you are going with option D. So there's one answer for option C as well. So again, yes, wow. <laughs> so you can see the answer is option D. And why option D is the answer? So congratulations to all of you who chose option D. And let's see why option D is the correct answer. So in option A, when students are asked to make a story chain, where every fourth student is supposed to change the direction of the story. It is a pedagogically sound uh, you know, procedure, but developmentally inappropriate. Uh, kindergarten students, uh, you know, for them, making a story chain and using this as a most effective way for active listening, it developmentally inappropriate. Then let us look at the option B. Option B involves the learners to listen passively because it is the song is playing in loop and they're working in groups. So it is not that effective method of teaching active listening skills. So this is not an appropriate answer. 
option C. Option C, you know, where uh, the teacher is giving earphones to children to listen to stories when they are by themselves in the quiet corners. This may not have active involvement of learners because they are in the quiet corners. Hence, this is not an effective way to develop active listening skills. Now, why option D is the correct option? Because here students are involved in the process. They have a criteria to respond to and on specific situation. So teacher has already told the story and now she is retelling and the children have to clap when the story changes. So this is a beautiful example of teaching active listening to students. So of course, uh, I think most of us have used this as well. And all the children are participating, uh, you know, together. And there and then you can see that who was listening very attentively and not or not. So very clearly, option D, and I saw most of you had answered correctly. So many, many congratulations. Wow, 58 of you have answered option D. So this shows that everybody, every one of you are doing wonders in your classrooms. And congratulations for that. So now we have looked at the MCQs and yes, so now we can look at the video assessment test. So in the video assessment test, there are two parts and the two parts are first is the subject specific verbal evaluation in which you get to choose. There are three questions which are given and these are subject specific. You can choose one question and attempt. I'll read the question for you. It says choose any of the following topics and introduce the concept as you would do in a classroom by linking it first to something the students may already know and then the actual concept and finally they use it. So first option is you are going to introduce the concept of conservation of numbers to your students in your class. Second is some students in your class who are four to five year old are having trouble identifying the letters with the sounds they make. And the third is you want your students who are five year old to develop active listening skills that we were just talking about. So you can choose any of the topics and introduce the concept to the class. So this is the first video evaluation and this is subject specific. And the second evaluation is the subject agnostic verbal evaluation. Here, again, you can choose from the three options. Choose any of the following topics and you share your thoughts. First is, does use of technology affect student learning? Second, what steps can you take if parents of students are not attending scheduled parent-teacher meetings? And the third is, when should skill-based education begin for students? So subject-specific will be to test your pedagogical competency with respect to your subject and subject agnostic will be to test your verbal communication skills essentially. So keeping that in mind, you can, uh, you know, prepare and keeping that in mind, you can answer in the videos. Okay. Hi, yeah. Hi, ma'am. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing everything and sharing your experience in terms of how uh, you prepared for the test, what was your thoughts while you attempted the question. And I think it was really insightful that uh, everybody got to know that how exactly we can figure out one question, how exactly we can, you know, understand that there are so many tricks that are involved in a question and how exactly do I need to prepare before uh, sitting for a TPO. So thank you so much, Monica, ma'am, for uh, sharing your insights. And it was really, really very helpful. <coughs> OK. So uh, moving on. We have obviously we not, uh, just discussed that uh, we like how to prepare for TPO and what thoughts are there in my head while I'm attempting the question. But of course, 
that there are so many other things that are involved in preparing for a particular test and CENTA international TPO being at an international level, we do have various resources for you to prepare while one of them can be a uh, CENTA TPO resource page, which you can consider as completely like a one-stop shop for everything that you need for prepare for this CENTA international TPO. <laughs> And over here, you will get various sample questions across different subjects. There are live webinars like we are doing right now. They'll be available on the website. Then uh, we do have recorded webinars and other free learning resources that will be available to you and uh, guides to prepare for the Center International TPO. And there is a curious corner as well where new resources are added every day in which you can maybe engage with and you can read through to <coughs> what the content really looks like. And there are various other things. If you go onto the page, you really can go through and just understand that, you know, there are so many other things that uh, are available on the center TPO resource page. So, and they are updated quite frequently and of course every day. So stay tuned to this page for your preparation and just have it all. Now, of course, uh, there is another part before attempting the test. Obviously we need to register. So if you want to know how to register for center TPO, the, there are three steps that we have where the first step would be to go to this Center TPO uh, website. Um, if I just show it to you very quickly that uh, if you click on the link, the center.org slash TPO 2022 slash. Uh, so this is the website that it looks like. If uh, it'll look like this. If you scroll down a little bit, you will see the register now option available over here. And uh, if you click on this, you will get a registration form and fill that registration form and make the payment for the applicable fee. And of course, then you can just uh, go through uh, the registration part of this. And there is one catchy thing that we do have a coupon code available, which is JAN30TPO. And if you use this coupon code while registering, you get a 10% discount. And of course, do remember that we do have this discount applicable only for next 24 hours. So please hurry up, share with your colleagues, share with your friends who do want to participate in this TPO and grab this discount for 10%. And thank you so much everybody for joining in this session and I hope you really have a good time and all the very best for your preparation.